The rumors on the internet never stop about the Steelers. We'll talk about some of the bigger ones, including the rumors about Jalen Ramsey's coming to the Steelers and our thoughts that here at the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. But the real talk about the cornerback position is who are the Steelers going to keep and who are they going to draft? Because they're going to make moves in both departments. I think that's what, what's really interesting to talk about that. Also, we'll talk about why the Steelers didn't go get an Eric Bieniemy guy when he left the Chiefs for Washington. All that more here in the North Shore Drive podcast from the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. I'm your host, Chris Carter, joined today by Brian Batko. Let's get into it. You are now listening to the North Shore Drive podcast, a show on all things Pittsburgh sports from the writers of the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. Hosted by Christopher Carter. Hello and welcome to the North Shore Drive podcast. I'm your host, Chris Carter. As always, you can find this show on all your podcasting platforms, Apple, Spotify, Google Podcasts, anywhere. You can also watch the show on YouTube if you're doing so right now. Like the video on YouTube, subscribe to this YouTube channel to get all of our daily content from the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette, as well as the North Shore Drive podcast that comes out Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays, talking all things Pittsburgh sports. As as I said before, we're joined by Brian Batko, one of our astute Steelers beat writers here at the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. Brian, I think that what we have become enamored with at this time of the year is the rumor mill. And it's not we, it's more so just everyone who wants to talk talk sports on Twitter, but there's nothing to talk about with when it comes to the Pittsburgh Steelers because there hasn't been big news. This is a dead time of the year. We're all waiting for the combine, and then that's, that kicks into pro days, and then the draft talk you know, kick, kicks into gear. But one of the rumors, quote-unquote, that's floated around is the Steelers could trade for Jalen Ramsey. And, you know, we had to entertain this about Marcus Peters last week, but is there like merit to, to moves like this, to these big swinging moves that, that Omar Khan could try to pull off when you're talking about guys that have some major cap hits that they would be bringing with them? No, I, I don't think so. I mean, and, and like you said, Chris, I get it. You know, it's fun to speculate. That's kind of what we do here. That's, that's kind of what's fun about following sports, especially in the off season. I mean, the NFL is like finally catching up to the NBA in terms of the off season intrigue. And I think right. like for a lot of people, the off season, you know, wheeling and dealing and behind the scenes stuff is almost surpassing the enjoyment of following the games themselves. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, that's not the case for me as a beat writer, but uh, of course, but you know, I look at like the NBA and that's kind of how I am as a casual fan with that league. Like I'm not sitting down and watching Nets Knicks on a Wednesday night in February, <laughs> but you know, in June, I want to see where all these guys end up and how it's going to work. And even the, the trade deadline that they just had. So uh, I understand all of that. And part of the very fabric of fandom is imagining a player that you love to watch and you've been rooting for, for a long time in your team's Jersey. And, you know, that's kind of the dream, right? But um, I just don't see, a big move being realistic for the Steelers, you know, a free agency type move like that, especially on defense when, you know, if you look at this roster as like a Thanksgiving dinner, you know, the turkey's already there, right? Like your your main dish is there. It's TJ Watt, Cam Hayward, Minka Fitzpatrick. You, you're going to have to get, you know, you just put some sides in around them you you can't afford to go out there and get another uh, big ticket item. You know that all the money's being invested in your top few guys. It's just realistic roster building that you're going to have to spend less in other places for the Steelers, especially lately. That's been corner. They moved on from the Joe Hayden era uh, last year to kind of mixed, varying results this past season. But I'm actually looking at that position specifically for this week's uh, analysis series that we'll be doing every Saturday, I believe, uh, leading up to the draft now. Jerry Dulac did the first one last week on the quarterbacks. This week, I've got the cornerbacks. So uh, I kind of looked into a lot of that. Levi Wallace is a sure thing to come back. And, you know, we'll see what happens with Cam Sutton. He's, his contract voided, technically, because of the restructure that he did. So he's available as a free agent. And you'd hope that the Steelers will be able to negotiate with him quickly and bring him back if you believe in his versatility. And I think that makes all the sense in the world, but I just don't think that you're going to patch that hole with a huge name, especially somebody who is, is going to want to get paid big money 
when you've you know you've put your big money chips on other positions. No, I, I'm right with you there. I just I think that this is a Steelers team right now that does have holes on it. And sure, if, if you didn't go get Cam Sutton, Jalen Ramsey sounds like a very attractive name. But Jalen Ramsey also hasn't exactly been, you know, super elite of late. Like there's been there's been times where he's been getting roasted, and he's still a phenomenal player. Like I would I'd still put him among the best cornerbacks in the NFL. But just adding him wouldn't fix everything. And this is a team right now that has to fill other holes. I think Cam Sutton's the kind of signee that you could bring back. He knows the team. He's a leader on the team. You know he fits. And you could sign him for reasonable vet money. Whereas like Jalen Ramsey, you'd be have to be paying probably around $20 million a year. And that's, like you said, they're already doing that with TJ Watt, Cam Hayward, Mick Fitzpatrick, the big money. 10 to $12 million a year, I think that could be a reasonable range that, 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 that you keep Cam Sutton for. And if you do that, then you can, like you said, Levi Wallace staying. You know, William Jackson the third, you could probably let him go and free up like twelve million dollars in in the, the the money that you got from his old contract. Uh Akella Witherspoon, you can decide what happens there. If they do let him go, that's another four million four million dollars that you add in. And that's where I think they put the Steelers could put themselves in a position where they could have a reasonably cap friendly cornerback room with solid veterans, and then add to it with some of the prospects that we're gonna talk about in the second segment because and, and that's why you keep taking cracks at guys like Levi Wallace and Akello Witherspoon. I mean, they're not the flashiest names, not the biggest numbers, but I mean, you give them moderately priced contracts in free agency, or in the case of Witherspoon, you know, first they traded for him because he wasn't working out in Seattle. And even the, you know, like the case of, again, keeping your own like Cam Sutton. Now I, I will be interested to see, you know, what is his market value? I, I could see that going both ways, Chris, like, will other teams, look at his somewhat pedestrian stat, you know, three picks last year, that doesn't jump, jump off the screen at you. Right. Um, but at the same time, you know, we know how versatile he is, can play outside, can play inside. I think he's probably a bet, you know, better against the run than maybe people give him credit for. And his football IQ is on the ceiling, as Mike Tomlin would say. So, you know, will the other 31 teams see the same value in that? Or will they just say, uh, he's kind of just the guy and he's more valuable to them than he is to us. I don't know. Um, you know, he's also 27. He'll be 28 next week. So uh, I'm not sure what his market will be. You'd have to think that, you know, for him, there's some, uh, you know, stability in, in the familiarity with the Steelers. If you do return, you know they like you and vice versa. But uh, that's that's why you keep taking swings on players who aren't all pro or even pro bowl caliber because corner is a spot where you just have to uh, get a little bit creative, spend a little less, and hope that you know you don't need that classic shut down half the field type of guy when TJ Watts getting to the quarterback in under two seconds. So, and right. Cam Hayward's collapsing the pocket, and Mika Fitzpatrick's got your help in the deep post. So, uh, yeah, I mean that's just kind of roster building uh, mechanisms there, and you know as you alluded to, when we'll get to. The rest is you try to find those guys through the draft. We'll talk about the draft in just a minute here on the North Shore Drive podcast. I'm your host, Chris Carter, joined today by Steelers beat reporter, Brian Batko. But first, we got to talk to you guys about our great sponsor, Valley Pool and Spa. And Valley Pool and Spa, of course, is the place that you got to go to to make sure that you get a hot tub, a swim spa, or a sauna installed right in your home to help you relax, de-stress, and get ready to take on your challenges and the day ahead. You could go to Valley Pool and Spa or their website, valleypoolspa.com, and you can check out all the different hot tubs and swim spas available. Or you can check out their Finlayo sauna, which you can't recommend more because it's something that's going to help de-stress, help melt your stress away, feel refreshed so that you can go out there, whether you're chasing kids around your house or you're chasing, uh, chasing tasks around your job. This is a place where you can have your own kind of peace, feel refreshed, and get back out there. Check out Valley Pool and Spa right now to get all their in-stock hot tubs, swim spas, and saunas by going to valleypoolspa.com. That's valleypoolspa.com. Back here on the North Shore Drive podcast, Chris Carter with Brian Batko talking all things Steelers. We're going to get to the Penguins in a bit with Matt Benzel, but I wanted to talk about you know, Brian, you're working on looking at this cornerback class and the things ahead with uh, with the guys that are that are in the NFL draft. And there, this is uh, you know by, by by a lot of people's standards, this is a very good cornerback class 
to be picking from here. Now, there's certain guys at the top of the list, like Devin Witherspoon and Christian Gonzalez, that I think everyone has is their 1A, 1B that they, they shift around as, who, as far as who is the best cornerback. Before we get to like the, the guys in the middle, we'll talk to Joe, talk about Joey Porter Jr. and guys like that in a minute. Are one of those players possible? Do you see one of those players dropping down to 17? Because every year cornerbacks go go high at some point. And there's a lot of different guys this year. There's there's quarterbacks that there's quarterbacks that I think that could go really early. There's offensive linemen, I think that could go early. There's a lot of edge rushers and defensive linemen, I think, that everyone are valuing this year. But is that enough to bump one of these two kind of run to the pony podium type of cornerbacks down into the Steelers range? Possibly, yeah, I, I think so. Especially this early in the process, it's it's really hard to say. I mean, you'd have to assume at least one or two of those guys will end up being taken in the top 16. Um, but, I mean, to your point, Chris, if quarterbacks really get pushed up, edge rushers, you know, e- even wide receivers, uh, I feel like this wide receiver class, there's uh, a lot of people who are kind of all over the board with, um, you know, their grades on these players. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't think that there's really a Sauce Gardner or Derek Stingley type uh, of corner in this group. And, you know, even Stingley, people were poking holes in his game by the end of the draft process last year, and he ended up having a pretty good rookie season for Houston. So, uh, no, I mean, right now as we sit here on February 22nd, 222, I don't think that there's like one guy in this group of quarterbacks in 2023 that I say, Steelers fans, don't bother getting to know him at all. He won't be there at 17. I mean, I guess Devin Witherspoon from Illinois is probably the closest to that. I mean, he really has kind of risen up the boards, it seems like, and, you know, opted out of the senior bowl, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. And Gonzalez from Oregon's got the size, the speed, all that. But, uh, yeah, I mean, I I don't think either of those are quite on the same level of prospect as, uh, you know, the reigning defensive rookie of the year who looks like he's going to be all pro for years to come for the Jets and Sauce Gardner. So, uh, yeah, I mean, there's uh, talent at the top. There's, I think, uh, some decent depth, too, in this class. So it's, it's not really a bad year for the Steelers to be going after one. And the other thing that I'll say, tying back into the first segment, again, we don't know for sure yet whether Cam Sutton will be back uh, with the Steelers, but if he is, that allows you to look at every type of corner in this draft. A, you know, a tall, physical, only going to play on the outside guy, that's okay because Sutton can be your slot. Or a smaller, quick, uh, you know, tackler who's going to play on the inside, that's okay too because you trust Cam Sutton with those perimeter duties. So, uh, that, again, is is the beauty uh, of his versatility. And there's obviously puzzle pieces to fall into place before you really dive into who would be the best fit with the Steelers. But I think it just makes all the sense in the world to get younger at that position. And ideally, if you don't have another Artie Burns scenario, you find your number one corner for the future. No, I feel you on that. And that's where I, I do agree. There could be some nice flexibility for the Steelers if they're able to bring back Cam Sutton. And then you say, OK, where should we go get get our guy? Because there's there's a, there's there is a, there are a bunch of six foot two type of corners in this in this draft cast draft class. Even outside of Christian Gonzalez, uh, uh, Joey Porter Jr. is one that everyone talks about. But Kelly Ringo of Georgia, he's an he's an, he's another one. Uh, Julius Brents is one that I've had my eye on. I thought he had a fantastic senior role. He's, he's six what six four? four? Yeah, yeah, I mean that is a tall drink of water out there at corner. Mm-hmm. And when you're he's six four, and just from the times that I've watched him, both in the senior bowl and going back to to uh to his his play his plays uh, in college, he looks like a guy that he knows how to manage himself at six four. Because there's a lot of lanky guys at six four that they rely on their length too much, and they don't they don't uh mirror wide receivers well. They get out of position pretty easily. But he looks like he has the footwork, the ability to change direction, the technique to be able to to stick with guys and jump passes. But like you said, long corners might not have to be the answer. You know, Clark Phillips III from Utah, he's 5'10", he's more of a slot guy, but he's a guy that, that could play. Emmanuel Forbes, a six-foot guy, uh, he's a person that I could see coming in and being a guy that could attack, that has a really good ball skills that maybe, like Cam Sutton, you move him around a little bit. And we know uh, Mike Tomlin, as he says, he likes his multiples uh, when he talks about versatile players. Maybe the move there isn't necessarily a pure outside guy, but another guy like Cam Sutton who could play outside but also could play slot and gives Terrell Austin and Grady Brown that flexibility to move corners all across the defense. Yeah, and, you know, when you talk about those two guys there, Clark Phillips the third, 
Can we call him CP3? Do we know no, if that was his nickname not. at Utah? That's pretty yeah. good, right? Yeah. Um, I mean, we're, totally, we're totally just robbing Chris Paul, but it's fine. Eh, he's washed. And then there's Emmanuel Forbes. Um, you know, you can start calling it Forbes Field if he's having success oh, uh, for the Steelers. But, uh, you know, the thing with both those guys, I'm sure some Steelers fans who are already kind of spooked by their track record with corners, uh, especially drafting them high, they're going to see a couple of somewhat frail players who are fast and have ball production. And you think already Burns, who, if I'm not mistaken, had five or six picks his last year at Miami. He had all the speed in the world, the athletic traits. He, you know, wasn't real built, but, you know, you just thought that he was a smooth mover and all that. He was essentially a draft and develop guy, and the Steelers didn't develop him. Now, was that on the coaching staff? Was that on Burns' own resistance to improvement? I don't know. Uh, it's, it's hard to know that without being inside that room. But these two, I think they're more of plug-and-play finished products. That, you know, if you do draft a, uh, a Keeley, is it Keeley or Kelly Ringo? I think it's Keeley. That's what I thought, yeah. So if you draft the Keeley Ringo, you know, you might have to do some development with him. I mean, he's a redshirt sophomore, so uh, he, he might have to, you know, continue to scratch at that ceiling for himself. Um, but, you know, there's also guys deeper in the, you know, or Brent's a six foot four corner uh, who's trying to transition to covering NFL speed week in and week out. I mean, that, you know, you're gonna have to do some coaching with a player like that who's maybe a little bit more of a project. But, um, you know, you've got to believe in the staff that you have, believe that, you know, you're, you're going to have a Cam Sutton type success story rather than an Artie Burns type of uh, disappointment if you go that route again with corner. And Chris, you know, I don't necessarily think they have to, to go corner at 17. I don't necessarily think they have to go corner at 32. I think you could find somebody at 49 who could be an upgrade in your talent, maybe even the third round if somebody slips. So uh, it's, you know, it's a good group, I think. And uh, it's one that the Steelers need to have their eye on. Uh, at the combine, see how these guys test. But we know that Mike Tomlin really values uh, making plays on the ball too. I mean, they they love ball production for sure. Again, it hasn't always worked out for them uh, with those draft picks. But uh, if you if you make enough plays, Mike Tomlin always says he's going to believe you. So guys like Clark Phillips, the third Emmanuel Forbes, I think they both had six picks uh, this past season. Uh, there's there's something to be said for being around the ball, finishing the play. Certainly, the Steelers led the NFL in interceptions last year uh, in Terrell Austin's first year as a defensive coordinator. So maybe that is a change of tone. We'll see how that plays out uh, moving forward. We got to switch topics and talk Penguins in a bit. Thank you, Brian, for bringing your expertise to the cornerback discussion for the Pittsburgh Steelers. We'll get to the Penguins in just a minute because they have fallen out of out of the playoff rankings in this in the standings. We'll talk about Matt Vensible, what's going on there, especially with some of the late games that they've given up. But first, we're going to talk to you guys about Yins and the Berg. If you're trying to get some get the Penguins in the spirit, maybe you want to get some Penguins gear to help to help yourself feel better about the Penguins. Best place to do that is go to the number one place for all Pittsburgh sports apparel. That's Yinzers in the Berg. And you go to you go to Yinzers in the Berg. They have Steelers gear, Pirates gear, Penguins gear, Pit gear, anything Pittsburgh sports. They have their right in the stores, and they have two stores for you to visit. It, both in the strip dish that you can check out all week long. But if you're not from Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh, or if you're not in Pittsburgh, if you can't get to the strip district, that's fine too. Because they got their website, yenzerspgh.com. At yenzerspgh.com, they're updating their merchandise on all things Pittsburgh sports weekly. So go get your Pittsburgh merch by going to yenzerspgh.com for Yenzer the Berg. Again, that's yenzerspgh.com for all your Pittsburgh sports apparel, accessories, and much, much more. Back here on the North Shore Drive podcast, I'm your host, Chris Carter. We switch topics from the Steelers to the Penguins. The Penguins, struggling of late. They lost 4-2 to two to the Islanders on Monday. They are set to play the Oilers this Thursday uh, at home. Matt Vensel, our Penguins beat writer, here to talk about that with us. Now, Matt, you wrote about how the Penguins had another third-period collapse they now lead the NHL in game with four games that they've lost after leading for two, you know going into the third period. And you know Tristan Jari was back, obviously rusty. What did you see that that led to that that's leading to, or is there a common element that leads to the Penguins' problems in keeping these late game leads? Yeah, I mean, I, I think some of these games are just they, they differ from one another. I mean, there are some common threads. Um, 
giveaways are one. I mean, that's what we saw in this last game here against the Islanders. P.O. Joseph tried to clear it, couldn't get out. Bo Horvat scored for the Islanders. And then Tristan Jari had the turnover that led to the winning goal. So I think that's a big one. I also think the Penguins just aren't generating enough zone time, and they're not bearing the chances that they do get. I mean, they had opportunities in that last game there um, to pull away. I mean, Teddy Bluger had a breakaway shorthanded. Brian Russ had a really good chance. They very easily could have made it 3-1. But, yeah, it's mystifying, though. I mean, I, I don't think there's a lot of easy answers here. I, I think the team is frustrated as a result. Mike Sullivan is frustrated as a result. Um, they're the league's worst third-period team since Christmas when you look at goal differential. Mm -hmm. uh, minus 11. And, and you know, I, I went back was looking this morning. I mean, they, they've blown a third-period lead six times. So, yeah, they've lost four games when they – we're trailing after two, but they've blown even more leads than that in the third period. So, I mean, this is an inconsistent hockey team. It really has been all season. You probably count on one hand the number of games where they put together a full 60-minute effort. But if they're going to play 20 minutes, they should probably play the third period. But they really have not been doing that. And as a result, they're out of playoff position right now. Well, that's what I wanted to get to about, too. They've now fallen below the eighth spot in their conference, which means if the playoffs were to start today, they don't, but they would be, they would be out. And this has been something that we've been talking about all season. Would this be the year that the streak ends? When you're talking to the players after, after that game, and it's another loss, another tough loss where, you know, they're, they're searching for answers. What do you see from this team as far as the confidence to try to figure this out? This is a group that's figured out a lot of problems over the past decade and a half. Uh, what do you see from them and how they're trying to figure out what's going on with themselves? I mean, they, they say all the right things. They say they haven't lost confidence. You know, when it's suggested that, that maybe they've become a little bit fragile, they kind of scoff at that. Uh, what they're doing in the ice suggests otherwise. But they do, you know, seem to believe they're going to turn it around and pull out of it. I mean, it, it's kind of misleading with the standings. If you look at points percentage, they would be in. Uh, they have a few games in hand on some of these other teams. But there's really six teams vying for a couple wild card spots. So it really is going to be a fight till the end. But... You know, in situations like this, I, I, I always tend to see what Sidney Crosby's saying. I, I think he's often the, the wisest voice in the room. Not to say these other guys aren't smart, but, you know, Sid's kind of – the thing he's been saying is we feel good about a lot of the things we're doing. You know, he said the same thing I, I mentioned a, uh, a second ago about they had chances to pull away, and for whatever reason, they just haven't been able to do it. So he seems to be pleased with the process. He seems to think that if they can just figure a couple of things out, maybe bury some of those chances, they're going to get going. We'll see. But I, I think this is a veteran group, and I think they they look at everything they've accomplished and the the situations they've been able to, to get through in the past and say, why can't we do it again? So I think that's kind of the mood in the room is, is what those leaders are saying, and I, I think they still believe they're going to get into the playoffs. Malcolm guaranteed it. Oh, that's I, I missed that guarantee. But I, I agree. I think that they do get into the playoffs. We've talked about this before. This team has found so many ways to win over the years. I'm not saying that this team is going to, you know, rise up and get to the Stanley Cup Finals again. I, I just think that they have enough in them that when Mar when March hits and you know and, and the and the games are really on the line to push them over the top, they're going to be able to beat out the Sabers and other teams that are that they're that they're duking it out right now at the you know the bottom of the playoffs uh, standings. In, in the east but i think the other thing that we've that we've been waiting to see was tristan jari's return and you know obviously you can't expect a guy fresh off of an injury to be back at their best game you know the steelers dealt with that with tj watt for several weeks this past season what did you see from jari as far as you know how he played in this last game and how long do you think it is until we start seeing the tristan jari that gets penguins fans excited with his ability to protect the net well, I think we already saw it. I mean, for two periods, he was pretty good. Um, and he also was just a stabilizing presence. I mean, when he's in net, um, he exudes calm. I know Mike Sullivan talks about that a lot. And it shows up to players, too. I mean, players, when they believe in their goalie and they're not worried, at like, okay, if we allow a two-on-one, it's going to go in the net, players kind of exude that calm as well. So you could feel that. Um, it just was a bad three-minute stretch for Jari that, that cost him, where he allowed a, a soft tying goal, and then he had to give away on, on some sort of miscommunication of what they wanted to do on that play behind the net. Um, I think, you know, I know Mike Sullivan kind of suggested that maybe just the fact that Tristan hasn't played in games, maybe he wore out there a little bit in the end. Um, but I don't think it's going to be too, too long until we see Tristan Jari, um, you know, be the guy we're used to seeing. But, but you know, we've talked a lot 
that there's a couple of different Jaris. I mean, he's a pretty good goalie, and then he has those stretches for like three, four weeks, once or twice a year, where he's unbelievable. So, you know, I think the Penguins will settle for the the former, just, you know, pretty good uh, Tristan Jari. But, you know, if they're going to do anything this year in the playoffs, they need that red-hot Tristan Jari dudes, you know, emerge, the guy that we saw in November and December when this team was looking like one of the best teams in the league. Right, and I, I I agree, and I think that's again why I I have still have a confidence that this team's gonna figure it out. You know, they're only a point behind the Florida Panthers. They're only two points behind the Islanders, even though the Islanders just beat them beat them last night. This is not something that's out of reach. Like you know, I know I know, you know Pittsburgh fans. There's pessimism pessimism when it comes to all sports when when things aren't going well. But I, I do see a lot of merits to this team. And yes, they're you know their third and fourth lines. They don't have answers. You know, we're still not sure what's going on, what Ron Heck still plans to do moving forward, if anything. But this is a team that has at least enough gas to get them to that point. And, yeah, would a matchup with the, you know, uh, the, the Bruins or, or the Hurricanes be good? You know, would it, would it go out, work out for the Penguins? Probably not in the, in the early rounds of the playoffs. But it's better to get there and find that out than to not get there, lose that playoff streak that's been the best in all of sports and then be sitting there kicking around at the end of the season like, okay, now now what do you do? Uh, but I, I'm right with you. I look at that. What is your opinion on, on the teams that they're competing with, the Islanders, the Panthers, uh, the Red Wings, the Capitals? Which of those teams are the teams that you're most looking out for? Is it the Islanders and Panthers who are in position right now, or some of those lower teams, do you see them jumping up uh, in, the, in the coming month here? Yeah, I still think the you know, of all those teams, the Penguins have the best statistical odds of making it. I mean, they, they have those games in hand. You know, you look at statistical models, they're still at like 55, 60% to make the playoffs, even though they're out of playoff position now. Um, New York definitely made some ground up by winning these two games, but, you know, they still kind of face longer odds, just given that they've played a few more games than the Penguins. I like Florida. You know, they, they, they played a few more games as well, but they're starting to get steam. They're in playoff position now. You know, I'm not sure about Detroit. Detroit's another team that has uh, played fewer games, um, which gives them more runway to, to make up ground. But that's a young team. I don't know which direction their management is going to go at the trade deadline. They might decide to, to be sellers, even though they're in striking distance. So, you know, I still like looking at these teams. I still think you know, Washington, you know, Washington is sputtering. They've been without a Vetchkin. I mean, I, I think these other teams, uh, some of them are stumbling as well. So I still think the Penguins are going to find a way to get there. Um, and then if I had to pick another team that's going to get the, the other wild card spot, I would stick with Florida, like we talked about here a couple weeks ago. Interesting. I, I'm very interested to see how that continues for them. The Penguins got to turn around and they got to play a tough team. The Edmonton Oilers, Connor McDavid and crew coming to town 7 p.m. at PPG Paints. Matt, Matt will be there hand, handling business as always. Matt, thanks so much for joining us here on the North Shore Drive podcast to talk Penguins. We'll be checking back with in, when you, in with you very soon to see how they continue to progress. This has been the North Shore Drive podcast from the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. Matt, do you have anything coming up that we, that we, that we need to tell people to look look for at the post at the Post-Gazette? Just my from the point column every Friday or in Sunday's newspaper. That's that's what I'm. I got my eyes on next. Oh, absolutely, do check out Matt. He he does a lot of great work as well as as his partner Andrew Destin. We'll keep keep you updated in all things Pittsburgh sports here on the North Shore Drive podcast. We're back Friday, so tune in then. We have Aditi Kinkabwala joining us to talk all things AFC North and Steelers, where the Steelers are there. Thanks again to Matt. Thanks again to Brian for joining me today. And thanks again to you, the dear listeners and viewers, on all your podcasting apps as well as YouTube. Like this video if you enjoyed it. Subscribe to this channel to get all of our daily content from the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette and our Monday, Wednesday, Friday episodes of the North Shore Drive podcast. Again, I'm your host, Chris Carter. Check out all of our work at post-gazette.com for the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. We'll see you again very soon. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of the North Shore Drive podcast of the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. If you're watching this video on YouTube, please like the video and subscribe to our YouTube channel. For six months of digital access to post-gazette.com for just $6, click the link down below in the description.